man of sin, Pope Francis the first steps onto the shores of the United States. I'm just going to do a four-part series within the two kingdoms, showing all the different things which are taking place in the world, which is going to threaten our religious and our civil liberties. Alan Robock is an American climatologist and distinguished professor of the Department of Environmental Sciences School of Biological Sciences at Rutgers University, specializing in bioengineering. He was approached and shared this secret meeting with the London Guardian on how the CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency of the United States, want to control the weather and use it in future warfare. That's crazy. Many may ask, where did they get that technology from? There are a number of theories. Operation Paperclip was a secret plan where the US government secretly smuggled Nazi scientists into the United States to not lag behind Russia in space technology during the start of the Cold War. Reinhard Gellin, Hitler's chief intelligence and espionage officer against the Soviet Union, was the key recruiter for the United States, where Nazi scientists like Walter Dornberger, who oversaw 20,000 men worked to death at Nordhausen concentration camp, became senior executive of Bell Aerosystems in the United States, and Werner von Braun, the Nazi scientist and rocket aerospace engineer who was responsible for the NASA space program, helped the United States in enhancing themselves as leaders in modern day space technology. But there is also Nikola Tesla, the Serbian born American who has given us the wireless age by inventing neon light, modern day radio that has given us the radar, mobile cell phones and the internet. When he died, his secret files were stolen, and many think his technology is what the US government uses, nicknamed HARP. But the CIA is accusing other intelligence agencies of using this technology to manipulate the weather. And if men are trying to manipulate the atoms in the troposphere, the ionosphere, and the stratosphere, that are the three principal layers of the atmosphere, they can probably disturb the turbulence and take planes out of the sky, cause tsunamis, hurricanes and probably earthquakes. Then people will start to question if modern day disasters are just natural causes or blatantly man-made. I do believe there is this prophecy that says that he doeth wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven. According to prophecy, that is how far they will take warfare. But let's observe other global plans that are in the pipeline. Recruit your operators from among the world's foremost elite. Borders and protocols are irrelevant. We must be the shield that safeguards the civilized world from those who wish to do it harm. Video games are one of the most powerful mediums to prepare you for what the future will look like. Rainbow Six Siege has special forces from all over the world who will put their differences aside and work together as a unit to fight against a so-called common enemy, a shadow of things to come. The term that has been given for this cleverly contrived cyber operation is predictive programming that has been described as to prepare and condition the mind to accept the cultural shock or social disorientation of forthcoming change. Another name is social engineering. And with a generation's minds being trained in military arts, they are carefully, without being aware of it, being prepared for the not too distant future. While many may think this is not plausible, an interview was conducted with a senior figure in the US Army on asymmetric warfare, where a make-believe city has been built for soldiers to practice training exercises in, and interestingly, there was a mosque and a church. Why a church? And 1,500 feet of tunnel. They gave callers an opportunity, 
and every single one of them were concerned and said it may look like overseas training, but it looks like something they're preparing domestically. Uh, good morning, C Span. Yes, uh, these buildings look like the United States uh, building because, you know, the way the uh, police are throwing black people in the inner cities and the uprising that we're having here in America, it looks like we're getting to, get to fight against our own people here. And it looks like y'all are training to more, more or less invade the inner city or, you know, it, it, it's mighty strange because everybody's training to do something overseas. And it doesn't look like overseas training. It looks like this is right here in America. And it's kind of scary because of the situation where we can't get police locked up for what they're doing to civilians and uh, the stuff that's going on here in America. So it's quite, quite, it's kind of damaging. Y'all, y'all, y'all are doing something secretly here, I think. Herbie, um, th that's uh, not really true. Um, what we're doing is training U.S. soldiers to be able to operate in any contingency around the world. Are, are urban centers then the new battleground? Well, when you look at uh, what's happening in the world today, um, there's a huge population growth. A lot of times we look at the growth of these mega cities uh, all over the world where there's, there's millions and millions of people uh, in a very close quarters. And if, if conflict is going to occur in regions like that, we want our soldiers to be able to understand the techniques that they've got to be able to apply in those environments. You do have a, a replica church and a replica mosque on campus. Why the importance of these structures? Well, you know, when, when I look at the church, I, I, I do have to reflect. It, 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 it's, it could be a church today, it could be a town hall tomorrow, it could be uh, you know, a store the next day. And what's really important about, uh, about the environment is as we, as we replicate is we want our soldiers to be sensitive to the fact that, uh, that all these things are going to be encountered when they're out, uh, out operating around the world. Uh, and we all know the media reports of, of soldiers uh, causing harm to, uh, to our cause uh, by being insensitive to those things. So by having those located here, we can sensitize our soldiers to the fact that, hey, you're going to be operating around sites that are very sensitive. One of the training eras was a subway. And while you may think this is confined to the United States, in the United Kingdom, a US ally, they are also doing terror drill training, where Britain's special forces, the SAS, also run to the aid of an attack in a subway in the event of a terrorist attack. A secret memo was leaked that confirmed that 5,000 soldiers will be deployed on UK streets if a so-called terror attack is to take place. But even those in influential positions are concerned about this heavily armed presence of the UK military in civilian space. According to the London Independent, accidentally leaked minutes from a meeting of the National Police Chiefs Council, NPCC, published as David Cameron flew to Southeast Asia planning to discuss ISIS with leaders in the region, said large-scale military support could augment armed police officers engaged in protective security duties. Baroness Jenny Jones, who sits on London's Police and Crime Committee, called the revelations absolutely shocking. Putting troops on the streets would be very controversial, she told The Independent. I think it would be very provocative and cause more problems than it would solve. I totally agree. If you happen to live in the UK, like myself, the narrator, can you imagine seeing officers armed like this? It would only take the slightest knee jerk for one of them to offload a round of shots in your cranium. And even films are sort of preparing minds for what would happen if another terror attack was to kick off in the heartland of the UK. Well, Let's see how the UK terror laws can criminalise absolutely anybody they please by being very vague on what a terrorist actually is. Soon we will make prevent a statutory duty for all public sector organisations. I want to see new banning orders for extremist groups that fall short of the existing laws relating to terrorism. I want to see new civil powers to target extremists who stay just within the law but still spread poisonous hatred. So both policies, banning orders and extremism disruption orders, will be in the next Conservative manifesto. 
So what is the extremism disruption orders that will be implemented by the British government and what will it entail? According to the London Guardian newspaper, this is an era fraught with difficulties that could see non-violent political activists in all sorts of areas deemed to be anti-democratic. Many in both the secular and religious communities can see where it is leading to. According to the Daily Telegraph, traditional Christian teaching could effectively be criminalised in some settings under David Cameron's plans for new anti-extremist banning orders, a top Anglican theologian and former parliamentary draftsman has warned. The Reverend Dr Mike Ove, a former lawyer and now principal of Oak Hill Theological College in London, a training school for Church of England clergy, said proposals for new extremism disruption orders could be a disaster era for people from all mainstream religions and none. Even basic Christian tenets, such as the belief that Jesus is the Son of God, could be deemed too offensive to other religions and branded un-British, he said. Many will say, here goes the Christian using a victim card again. But calling homosexuality a sin can be seen as a sign of extremism. And the LGBT community is pushing for criminalizing teachers as domestic terrorists who call homosexuality a sin. And this is being supported and endorsed by a British politician who said it should be enforced under the new extremism disruption orders. In the Huffington Post, it records that Mark Spencer has called for extremism disruption orders measures intended to stem radicalization by extremists to instead stop children being taught old-fashioned views on homosexuality by traditionalist teachers. Christians are taking the LGBT agenda too lightly. Keith Wood, executive director of the National Secular Society, said in a statement, if EDOs really could be used to prevent teachers from talking about same-sex marriage unless they are inciting violence, they are an even greater threat to freedom of expression than feared. To suggest that EDOs guarantee freedom of expression is not just inaccurate, it is the opposite of the truth. They are the largest threat to freedom of expression I have ever seen in Britain. Even the secular community, like this man Keith Wood, have picked up that these draconian laws has wider ramifications for all society and will eventually infringe on their free speech. Where did this precious gift of free speech actually come from? What I learned at university and has been recently been revealed has come to light. It was the Protestant Reformation that used the social media of its day via the printing press that brought about free speech according to the London Economist. This painting dated to around 1542 by Girolamo de Traviso shows the four Gospels stoning the Pope, representing England and half of the European continent separating itself from papal control. Building on from that heritage in the 17th century, poet John Milton, famous for the work Paradise Lost, wrote a tract in 1644 titled Areopagitica advocating for free speech where he wrote of the importance of free speech when he said that this is true liberty when free born men having to advise the public may speak free free speech which he who can and will deserves high praise who neither can nor will may hold his peace what can be juster in a state than this. But even those in the media are not safe. Edward Snowden, an NSA whistleblower, leaked classified files to the London Guardian newspaper that the planet was being surveillance by the NSA and GCHQ. The London Guardian is one of the most widely read newspapers online in the world 
that was named Newspaper of the Year at the 2014 British Press Awards for its reporting on government surveillance. The Guardian Editor-in-Chief Alan Roosbridger continued a dialogue with Snowden and interviewed him on US surveillance. But even in a democratic state, there are restrictions on free press. And the UK government told The Guardian, all right, you had your fun, mate. Now destroy all of your hard drives with the Snowden files or we will take legal action. Not even the media is exempt from the controlled government restrictions. We were faced effectively with an ultimatum from the British government uh, that if we didn't hand back the material or destroy it, they would move to law. That would mean prior restraint, uh, a concept that is uh, anathema in America and other parts of the world, in which the state can effectively prevent a news publisher from publishing. Uh, and I didn't want to get into that position. And I also explained to the UK officials we were dealing with that there were other copies uh, already in America and Brazil so they wouldn't be achieving anything but once it was obvious that they would be going to law uh, I would rather destroy the copy than hand it back to them or allow the courts to freeze our reporting but the the British government about 12 13 years ago actually created this lawless bit of Britain where anybody can be questioned for up to nine hours uh, without access to a solicitor and where all your belongings could be confiscated and there's nothing you can do about it. The United States and its allies are tightening the reins. And this war manual by the Pentagon, dated to June 2015, is clear that journalists are no exception. In its introduction, it says that the preparation of this manual has also benefited from the participation of officers from the United Kingdom's Royal Air Force and the Australian Royal Air Force on exchange assignments with the US Air Force. In addition, military lawyers from Canada, the United Kingdom, New Zealand and Australia reviewed and commented on a draft of the manual in 2009 as part of a review that also included comments from distinguished scholars. So this has been six years in the making, and in section 4.24 under the heading Journalists, it reads that in general, journalists are civilians. However, journalists may be members of the armed forces, persons authorized to accompany armed forces, or unprivileged belligerents, which many have interpreted as domestic terrorists. And when America sneezes, the world catches the cold. And this global war on terror is carefully and gently crippling free speech, where it will get to a stage that standing for the truth will eventually be labeled as a criminal offense. It is fair to say that the stone is coming for those who understand prophetic language. So the intelligence agencies are manipulating the weather for warfare. We see that calling homosexuality a sin is going to be considered as domestic terrorism. We can see that the police and the army are being trained for what's to come. And we can also see that journalists are being targeted if they go against the mainstream line of Western reporting. So we really have to get our lives right.